Hey, what's up everybody? I get a lot of questions from people asking me how to become a web developer. Well, I recently had the privilege of talking to Quincy Larson, the founder of Free Code Camp. And Free Code Camp is one of the largest online learning platforms to learn web development, helping literally millions of people learn web development and get a job in that field. So this video is gonna be an interview with him talking about what it takes to be a web developer and what you need to prepare to get your first job as a web developer. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. And if you guys got any questions or comments, please leave them below and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome Quincy. I'm glad to have you on this channel. Why don't you uh, take a minute to introduce yourself and tell everyone what you're about. Sure. Hey everybody, I'm Quincy and I am uh, a teacher by training and I spent about 10 years as a teacher and as a school director. And then I learned to code in my 30s and I realized how powerful coding was and I decided that I should take my teaching skills and turn them toward teaching technology. And so I created freecodecamp.org and now I'm, through Free Code Camp, we're helping millions of people learn to code and get developer jobs. That's awesome. So one of the things I really like about Free Code Camp and I don't know a ton about it, but I know a little bit. And one thing is that it's free. So I always get a ton of questions from people asking, hey, what's the best way to learn to code for free? And I'm gonna ask you, um, what, what, when it comes to strategy, you know, what are what are the the ways that people should, should go about learning to get a, a software engineering job or start their own business? Well, the most important thing is just practicing a ton. Uh, you know, there, Getting a job, actually, you have to have good interview skills. You have to be able to put yourself out there, be resilient to failure, all of those things. But in order to actually be able to, you know, ace these coding interviews and, and get a good job, you have to really, really put in the time and the energy practicing and learning the code. So I encourage people to just plan to spend as much time as possible building projects, um, going through algorithm, puzzles and and just really grinding and, and learning as much as possible. So with Free Code Camp, you have a pretty uh, comprehensive curriculum. How long does it typically take for someone to go through it? Well, very few people have completed everything because usually people get a job before they do. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> if you were to be an absolute beginner, and let's say you have basic, like you can read and you can do basic math and stuff like that, but you haven't uh, spent a lot of time programming or really doing much of anything related to technology. We estimate that each of the six certifications would take about 300 hours each. It's about wow. 1,800 hours. So assuming that you're uh, learning to code full time, like 40 hours a week, that would take you about nine months. Wow, that's quite the while but uh that is that's not terribly long in, in the big scheme of things so that's that's pretty awesome especially for how much content's covered in in that amount of time uh just some questions about the actual curriculum i imagine you have people that go through it and they have a good experience and then occasionally you probably have some people not have such a great experience so from your perspective what are some of the things that that help people perform better um, do people tend to struggle with concept or applying the concepts to coding? Uh, just anything you got. I think the biggest thing that people struggle with is just, they're not used to getting that immediate feedback that you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like here's an error statement. Uh, read this stack trace. There, read where you were imperfect in what you did earlier. And uh, so there's a little bit of a psychological barrier just trying to accept that, oh, wow, like, I really have to get this exactly right. And the computer is not going to afford me much leniency at all. Because let's say you take an English comp class, you know, your undergraduate college or your high school English composition, and you're writing like an argumentative essay. And you can turn that in and the teacher is going to not be super granular in the way they grade it. And most likely they're going to say, yeah, this, I'll let this slide because they're young and like they don't know what they're doing. Oh, they misuse this word. Maybe I'll draw like a little line here, but I'm not gonna take off points. When you write an algorithm, if there's an error, it just crashes and it refuses to go forward usually. And so that is very strong, immediate negative feedback. Right, so yeah, totally. It takes a while to get used to, okay, first of all, faster than I can blink, I'm gonna get the results. Uh, because computers think way faster than humans do in most respects. 
or not in most respects, but in, in some respects, certainly in terms of just crunching numbers and figuring out whether, um, you know, code has an error in it. <laughs> I mean, you can do that almost instantaneously. Yeah. So I think it's just that psychological shift between, you know, in real life, people are pretty polite to one another and the computer doesn't, uh, it, it dispenses with all the pleasantries and it just says, hey, there's an error here, fix this. <laughs> so I would say that's the biggest thing. And, and people uh, often, maybe they feel personal, they take it personally. Uh, you, know, right. you are not your code. There are going to be bugs in everybody's code. Yeah, I think uh, that's good. Because even people who've been developing their whole lives are still going to have bugs in their code. And I think that's something a lot of beginners don't realize. Yeah, and, and people are going to have to look things up. That's another thing. People think that, like, oh, I'm going to memorize you know, this syntax, and I'm going to memorize this structure, and I'm going to memorize exactly how, you know, where I should put the curly braces, and where, you know, what what the layout of a function call is. And uh, they, they think, they approach it in the same way you might approach learning French in, mm -hmm. in high school or something like that, where you just have to, if you just memorize things and learn these specific things, you'll be all good. But it's not about retention at all, because at any time, I can just type something into the address bar of my browser and pull up a Stack, Flow, Stack Overflow article or a question answer combination that, that has all the details and it's way better than anything I would be able to try to remember on my own. So uh, when you're programming, you're not just trying to cram, which is what traditional education generally teaches people to do, at least here in the West. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Instead, what you're trying to do is you're just trying to get kind of a almost a subconscious feel for how things should be and it's hard to really put your finger on how you're progressing and some days you may feel like you haven't progressed at all it may feel like you're backsliding mm, yeah but in fact every hour that you spend at the keyboard coding you are making progress it's just sometimes harder to to see yeah in my experience it always worked in in large sections. So I'd have a day or two where I get no progress. And then the next day I have a huge victory and makes all that, that struggle worth it. Yeah. And I can tell you from working in the field, I, I meet people who have spent months of their waking lives tracking down a single bug. Yeah. And if you look at what the progress that looks like, like the progress in learning French, uh, you know, every day you're learning a few more words and you've got this nice smooth uh, upward, um, you know, chart of your your progress. Well, when you're when you're spending months trying to diagnose and fix a single bug, your progress looks like this: it looks completely flat, and then one day, it just jumps up. So a lot of these things can be kind of counterintuitive, uh, you know, especially when you're coming from kind of a gamified traditional education system where you progress through, you level up with a new grade every year. And, uh, you know, you've got clear objectives. You've got to pass this test. You've got to turn this term, pa term paper. And then you're dumped into the very amorphous field of software development where the entire field really has only existed for 60, 70 years, um, you know, in, in, in its most modern form for sure, uh, beyond just abstract math and stuff. So everything is very... Um, it, again, amorphous, and it, it just doesn't feel as concrete what you're doing. So that can be a big hurdle for people, uh, but it's just a psychological hurdle. Almost all the challenges associated with learning to code and succeeding and, and getting your first developer job and then progressing through the ranks of uh, moving up in an organization, uh, whether that's in a technical or non-technical direction, you want to go into management or something like that, product management, almost all that is psychological. It's not a matter of innate ability. It's not a matter of you know access to resources or access to faster, more powerful computers or anything like that. It's almost all just about whether you can keep yourself motivated and sitting down and cranking out code and learning. Yeah, totally. Uh, so I have a, a question for you. So when I was going through school, I went to you know public high school, just like most people, and I really felt like I, I didn't fit inside of the the box they kind of form people to so do you feel that there's a sort of like a strong calling for you know self-starters and people that don't really fit the status quo in development or do you think it's just general that anyone can really go into it and succeed well i think anybody can go in and succeed yeah totally. i think uh, 
as opposed to other fields where there's a more traditional career progression, like if you want to go into medicine, well, it's extremely regimented. First, you have to get a four-year degree, and you have to meet certain biological prereqs. Then you have to go to, at least in America, you have to go to a four-year uh, you know, medical school. And then you have to find a residency and spend three to five years working as a resident. And then you get your license. You have to pass like board <laughs> examinations and everything like that and meet all these other criteria. And then you have a license to practice medicine. Right? So, so basically from you know, high school on, it's already determined you have to do all this stuff in order to be a doctor. And yes, I have friends who decided in their, in their late 20s, early 30s that they wanted to become a doctor. But I don't have friends in their late 40s or 50s that decided they want to become a doctor because there isn't enough time, yeah, generally. Totally. And, uh, and there aren't really like clear pathways for people who are not already on the kind of straight and narrow track. Then you look at software development, and it's completely different. And I mean, anybody at any period in their life can become a professional software de developer and can leverage those skills to become an entrepreneur, to create a startup, uh, or uh, just to you know, rise in the ranks of, an, uh, of a tech company. So, and not just tech companies, but like banks, um, hospitals, all these organizations use code and need programmers. So um, there's no standard certification. There's no, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> there, there's no uh, body of bureaucrats that say, oh, you have to have completed this specific task or you have to have written a compiler specifically in C um, or you, you need to be able to pass the standardized test for Fortran. I mean, that's what it would look like if we had yeah. standardized things, unfortunately. Um, if you know how medicine and law and all these other things are organized or any uh, uh, basis for that. So um, I think because anybody at any point in time can sit down and use free online resources, can use books, um, can take free online courses, um, can go to a hacker space, can go participate in hackathons and uh, you know, because anybody at any time can do it, it absolutely attracts a lot of those people who are kind of otherwise frozen out of the knowledge worker type positions that society exalts. Um, so it absolutely does draw those kinds of people, but those are not the only kind of people who can succeed in software development. I firmly believe that anybody uh, who is sufficiently motivated can sit down and learn to code and go out and achieve great things. Related to this, some of the, the advice I've given some of my viewers is if you feel like you need that additional structure then you should consider a bachelor's program. So I thought I'd ask you, do you consider online learning and free learning programs as like a, a replacement to a traditional bachelor's program? Or do you see it as a different route or supplement? What do you, what do you see it as? I see it as a uh, supplement um, in some cases, but in other cases it's a substitute. Um, because I know hundreds <laughs> of developers who didn't finish university and are working as developers and you know, initially maybe there was like a slight uh, penalty in terms of their compensation or what level they could enter the field at or what kind of companies they could get jobs at. Um, but, you know, once you get past that, it doesn't really matter. Like a few years out, there's very little or any differentiation between like the career uh, trajectories of people who mm -hmm. did a four-year degree or didn't. And, and another thing uh, that I'll point out is a lot of people, like I went to college, I even went to graduate school. Um, I, if you have that luxury, if you can afford to go to university, I would certainly encourage everybody to do that. But I would not build your entire life around the notion that you have to go to university anymore. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. And I would definitely not encourage people to go to a, a private university where they're going to rack up a ton of student debt, even if it's a prestigious one, um, because it – there's something we said for not having a lot of student debt and just having the flexibility to do things in your twenties and thirties where you're not, your entire life isn't structured around trying to pay down this debt that will yeah. follow you, Haunt forever, you. <laughs> even, through, even through bankruptcy. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and so should you go to university if you are high school age and you have the resources? Absolutely. I would strongly recommend you go to university. Should you go to university if you're mid twenties and haven't ever finished university? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, and 
if you have a university degree that's not in computer science, I wouldn't recommend going back and getting a like a, a master's in computer science to compensate or trying to get a second undergraduate degree. I would just accept that you have, you know, a major that is not directly relevant to software development and move on. One of the things I'll point out is that like very few of my colleagues in software development have an undergraduate degree specifically in computer science. Yeah. But if you are going to a university in 2018, you should absolutely study computer science. It is by far the best subject you can study. It's even better than software engineering. Some universities have software engineering uh, programs, but from all the data I've looked at personally, and I've done quite a bit of research, of it, I've written a lot of core answers on this stuff, all the data seem to suggest that computer science is the more flexible, superior degree. I mean, you can you can go into pretty much any field with that. You, you may really love reading history books, um, but you can do that without doing that in a formal education system. Computer science, um, on the other hand, you can absolutely learn it elsewhere. But just the fact that you have a computer science degree is a huge kind of badge. But but you know, if if an organization insists that you have a computer science degree. Just keep looking because there are plenty of organizations that don't. So from the students that go through free code camp, do you feel like a lot struggle with more understanding the concepts of algorithms and time space complexity and object oriented programming? Or do you feel like they're really weak with applying that in actual code? So free code camp's curriculum is you're coding 100% of the time. The entire curriculum is interactive and in that it's, it's all applied skills. If you look at the different skills we cover in our curriculum, almost all of them start with applied. Okay. Applied visual design, applied data visualization. Uh, and, and the reason for that is there's an entire theoretical you know, area of these things that you should also get exposure to, but interactive coding isn't necessarily the best place to teach you theory. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's one of the things we do all the time with Free Code Campus. We just publish these huge lists of free university courses from like MIT, Stanford and all these other great prestigious organizations um, that create traditional lecture-based uh, courses where you you know maybe you watch a lecture and then you answer some multiple choice questions or maybe you build some sort of more academic model. There's this you know academic code quality is a, a basically it doesn't need to work really well or be like reproducible or be ready for production if it can be enough to get you an A. On the on the um, in the class, then that's good enough, right? Uh, so, as part of going to you know a and and you can do like the equivalent of a traditional computer science degree on edX or on Coursera, uh, you know, for free or, or very inexpensively. And MIT has been you know publishing their open source or open courseware for like decades, so the. All the resources you need are out there, but for free code camp, it's absolutely focused on the practical aspects of it rather than the theoretical. Um, and I believe that in general, you can get away with less theory and more practice uh, because it's much easier to go and backfill theory than it is to go and backfill practice. So um, moving on to some other questions, I imagine there have been some crazy success stories with Free Code Camp. Do you have any that really stand out to you? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you a couple from you know just the past few days. Um, this guy Jordan, uh, I'm trying to remember his last name. I just sent out an email blast. I sent out this email blast every every week to like 1.5 million people, and uh, I included his story as one of the links. But he uh, he was in the he was active active duty enlisted US Air Force and uh, he was able to you know use free code camp to ramp up his developer skills while he was still you know in the Air Force and then he was able to get an internship at Twitter through uh, wow. this, this program like a lot of organizations are actively trying to hire uh, veterans and uh, I, I think it's great and we want to get as many uh, veterans who are coming back from overseas as possible uh, into into companies. And so he was able to get in, into Twitter as an intern, and uh, he committed a lot of code directly to Twitter's code base. And recently, they you know promoted him to a full-time software engineer. Oh, that's so, incredible! You know, his background is basically 
free code camp and then just a bunch of practice. <laughs> but uh, we published that a few days ago and uh, uh, we published his story in the free code camp medium publication. So you can check that out. I'll, I'll give you a link if you want to put it in the description. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. And then, you know, like yesterday, less than 24 hours ago, a woman emailed me and she said that uh, she'd been using FreeCodeCamp extensively in 2016 and that helped her get into software development. And now she was in a leadership position at uh, an organization that does like paid apprenticeships. Like, so you can basically, it, you basically get paid to work for a company. And uh, she said that because FreeCodeCamp was so helpful for her that she was basically, that was the standard, standard issue um, curriculum that everybody who applied for that program had to work on. Oh, cool. So, um, and, you know, we've got tons of uh, universities, coding boot camps, um, high schools, programs all around the world that are using free code camps, free open source curriculum uh, to help people at an institutional level uh, advance their developer skills. And we're working on an open API and a classroom mode tool that'll make it easier for these organizations to use it. But uh, just thousands of people are getting their first developer job every year as a result of, uh, at least in part, free code camp. They'll, they'll use free code camp, but we're not a one-stop shop. I strongly recommend people use all the resources that are available to them. Uh, all the free university courses, all the different um, GitHub repos you can clone and you can run little scripts locally and, and learn how to use different tools that way. Uh, there's a huge community of just so many developer resources and I encourage people to use as many of those as they want. How exactly does a new developer get started with open source? Uh, from from my perspective, it's it's a little scary. There's so many projects and so many different languages and frightening code. So maybe you can give us the, the crash course. Yeah. Well, there are two websites that I'd, I'd send everybody to. One is called um, upforgrabs.net. And if you go there, it's just a list of open pull requests. And, and these are specifically designed with, with relative beginners in mind. Um, and so you can look at these, and if, if an organization takes the time to put themselves on upforgrabs.net, that means generally they're very serious about helping onboard new developers into open source. Um, another uh, project is uh, Ken C. Dobbs. He's got a, a project called First Timers Only. And if you go there, uh, he's got a ton of different resources uh, to help you get started contributing to open source. And there's like this little tag you can put, and we put it on some of our repos that says first timer only for like a GitHub issue. And so that person knows, first of all, that me or somebody else who's who's maintaining free code camp has specifically thought this is a good project for somebody who's never contributed to open source before. And that's awesome. This is a good issue for them. I already know how to fix it, but instead of fixing it, I'm gonna create this issue and somebody can jump in and try to fix it and then I'll be in a good position to, to help them out because I already know how to do it. Um, so that's like a perfect situation where people from uh, the developer community who are more more senior, more experienced, can kind of pass the skills on to, to newcomers. Uh, looking through uh, your curriculum for free code camp, I notice a lot of it is kind of based around the idea of a full stack web developer. So we talk about web design and, and JavaScript and React and databases. Do you believe that this is the place that new developers should start with going into the, the full stack web development route? Yeah, absolutely. And there are several reasons why I think full stack web development is the best place to start. Um, first of all, JavaScript is the most flexible programming language in human history. At this point, like you can use it for quite literally anything, it has the biggest package ecosystem in human history. NPM has, I don't know how many <laughs> millions of packages. <laughs> More than we need, yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, Node is a, you know, a runtime that can be used on refrigerators, drones. Uh, it can also, you can use tools like React Native to build mobile, mobile applications. Um, you can just build mobile web stuff, progressive web apps, and 
then people can use their phones or any device with a browser to access them. If you learn full stack web development, you're going to learn how to build you know, an API. You're going to learn how to do all the associated backend logic. And you're going to learn um, security, testing, debugging, all these additional yeah. skills. And the great thing about the web is it's not owned by anybody. If you if you want to become an iOS developer, well, guess what? You're basically at the whim of Apple. If Apple changes something, I mean, you're just working with their specific tools that they designed specifically for you. It, it's kind of like .NET. Like being a .NET developer, you have a much better developer experience in terms of, hey, there's this giant corporation that uses this internally, and they built all these tools, so it can make, me, make it very easy for me to build Windows applications build like web applications that is they've kind of gone through and you know smoothed out all the edges for you. So web development by comparison is rougher and it, it's a little bit harder. <laughs> so you'd ask, well why would you start with something that's harder? Well you can take those skills. You don't it's, you're not learning a toy language and toy frameworks and toy skills. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Like I, I would recommend if kids, like young children, are learning, they should probably look at Scratch, uh, you know, and and languages like that to learn first. But if you want to spend your time productively, assuming you're a busy adult, and a vast majority of people who use free code camp are busy adults, so the median age is like 30. So if you're a busy adult, that's great. You don't have a lot of time for academic exercise. You want to learn you know, the low hanging fruit that you can immediately turn around and apply. And that's absolutely web development. About half of all developer jobs, according to the most recent Stack Overflow uh, survey of 60,000 ish uh, professional developers, about half of those jobs are specifically web development. One of the reasons I encourage people to go directly into full stack web development is it's a strong foundation from which you can specialize. You shouldn't try to specialize based on hypotheticals about what you think the job market is like. Oh, I think that there's going to be a big demand for database administrators, so I'm going to do that. Or I think that this specific framework is going to really explode and uh, there will be a lot of jobs for that. What you should do is you should become a generalist and then you should get a job and then you should specialize while you're on the dime. Yeah, and none of this knowledge, like even if, uh, like I meet people all the time who are dead set on becoming back end developers specifically. Oh, I don't need to learn the front end stuff. <laughs> I have no interest in that. Well, guess what? It's going to help a tremendous amount if you can empathize with the front end developers, if you can communicate to them, and if you understand how things are working on their end so you're not just throwing your code over the proverbial cubicle wall. Totally. Yes. Having that integrated perspective on things will be incredibly important. And that's one of the reasons why computer science degrees are so great because. You do learn how you know memory management works, and you you do learn how code compilation works, and things like that that um, you know could be useful in some specific instances when you're trying to do like high performance computing or you're trying to diagnose a you know a very nasty bug, for example. It could be you know beyond what you normally work with, and the code could be much deeper, and it could be something you're doing is causing this effect many layers of abstraction down the stack. So the more you know, the better. And it definitely doesn't hurt to spend a few extra weeks learning some skills that may or may not actually be relevant to what you're doing if it's clear that like employers are looking for you know the integrated skill set. So what I said earlier, thousands of people are getting developer jobs based on what they're learning through Free Code Camp every year. Um, and a big chunk of those people, some of those people get a job and they're working in Java. Some of them are working on Ruby on Rails apps. We don't teach Ruby on those apps. Or we don't teach Java. Uh, but people are able to take like the high-level scripting languages, the web development frameworks, uh, the databases, all the different tools that they're learning through Free Code Camp, all the different methodologies, the foundational knowledge, the fundamentals that we really drill into people. Because I, I personally think fundamentals are absolutely vital. If you master the fundamentals, then you're always in a good position to learn the latest tools. Let's just uh, talk a little bit about the curriculum. And by a little bit, I'd like to do a deep deep dive. So yeah. let's talk about what are the major sections, topics, and how long do each one take? So the way we built the curriculum is to, to have each certification be about 300 hours. And that's, a, again, it's a pretty rough estimate, assuming you have no programming experience. 
Some people may take slightly longer. I wouldn't feel bad about it. It's a lot to digest. Uh, so we've got six certifications, and if you claim all six of those, then you can also claim what we call the full stack developer certification, which is kind of the ultimate certification. So first, people learn responsive web, uh, responsive web design, which starts with basic HTML, HTML5, and they learn CSS. We teach applied visual design and accessibility, responsive web development principles. And then we teach some popular CSS tools that are now native CSS, Flexbox and, and CSS Grid. And then uh, at the end of every certification, or really whenever you want to, there are five projects. And you just have to build those projects and get all the tests to pass. And if you do, then you can claim the certification. So let's say hypothetically you are already you already have a computer science degree or you've already worked as a developer for a year or two. You just want to get the certification. You don't need to actually go through any of the coding challenges. You just go straight to the projects and see if you can build those. And you get the certification. So even though this is a 300 hour certification, you could in theory, if you were really fast, maybe get it in 10 or 20 hours by just building the projects real quick. So after the responsive web design certification, we have a JavaScript algorithms and data structure certification, which is just focused on basically, you know, coding, just doing JavaScript. So, so you start learning basic JavaScript, then you do ES6, which ES6 is a more general name for ES 2015, 2016, 2017. 2018, like ES6 is just the general term we've come up with for uh, the newer features that are added to JavaScript, which um, ES stands for ECMAScript, which is kind of sounds more like a skin disease than a programming <laughs> language. So we just call it ES because that sounds cool, right? Um, and so we teach regular expressions. Uh, they are useful. It's true that like what they say sometimes you have a problem and you think, I'll solve this with regular expressions. And then you have two problems. <laughs> yeah, I do that with my homework. Like, I'll write a pro <laughs> program to solve this. I spend twice as long and have 40 bucks now. <laughs> so basically, yeah, we hand them a loaded shotgun pretty early on in the uh, JavaScript algorithm and data structures certification by teaching them regular expressions. But then we immediately try to teach them debugging. <laughs> so that should help a little bit, right? Um, and then uh, we just dive into the data structures. And the main data structures we talk about are you know, the ones that are native to, to scripting languages, like arrays, key value pairs, objects. Uh, and then um, we don't go too into like complicated data structures here in, in this certification. Uh, but we do go really in depth and talk about like you know, trees and all kinds of stuff uh, when we get like in the, in the coding prep section, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, or the, the coding interview preparation uh, section, which is just a massive section that takes uh, thousands of hours if you want to complete all those challenges. Uh, it's, it'll be a never ending source of frustration for you should you choose to go down that path. But um, yeah, with basic data structures, then we go into algorithms, and, uh, and these are mostly just you know build a cash register that accepts certain you know, denominations of money and then like, you know, provides change. Um, and we cover functional programming, object oriented programming, and and just the projects themselves will, will keep you busy. Like there's a Caesar cipher, uh, which is kind of like the, the ROT 13 thing, uh, which is one of the, probably one of the most common computer science uh, assignments ever. Uh, and then, you know, palindrome checker, uh, and telephone number validator to really strengthen your regular expression skills. So um, that is, I think, a great place to start. Like if you are not interested, and I just spent you know ten minutes telling you why you should be interested in learning front end, even if you're just seriously focused on back end. But if if that didn't convince you, start with the JavaScript algorithm and data structure certification instead of the responsive web design certification. Mm, yeah, neither of them have any like dependencies where you need to have taken one or the other first. So you can start with either of those certifications. We recommend doing the responsive web design first just because HTML, CSS, they're a little bit more forgiving than JavaScript. And, and you can get kind of a visual, you can see the output of your code rather than just seeing like a console output uh, and test output. Um, then we have front-end libraries, which is another 300-hour certification. 
You'll learn Bootstrap. You'll learn jQuery, SAS, React, Redux. Um, and a, there's a lot of, you know, chatter right now about jQuery being, like, unnecessary. And, and some people will say the same thing about Bootstrap. I think these are great tools that make things easier. Mm -hmm. And if you really need to shave 32 kilobytes out of your website, even though it's probably going to be cached in your browser anyway, because, like, 90% of the web uses jQuery still, probably 25% of it uses Bootstrap, um, you can shave those out. But I, I still think that they're good tools to just quickly get something up and running. Um, but yeah, we, we cover a lot of other front-end libraries. And then you'll build some projects. Uh, you'll build a Pomodoro clock. You'll build a random quote machine, a, a drum machine. Um, and then uh, the fourth certification is the data visualization certification. And that basically, you just learn D3JS, which is an amazing library for doing data visualization. And a lot of people are like, data visualization, is that, is it that important that you need, you know, it needs to have its own standalone certification? I personally think that visualizing data is going to become more and more important. You know, we're, we're generating more and more data. It's harder and harder to describe a lot of the data in words. Being able to create inter interactive uh, visualizations you can communicate so much so quickly to people and increasingly like user interfaces on different things. Even if you go to like Twitter and look at their Twitter analytics and stuff, they, they have some visualizations there. So then we, after data visualization, we get into uh, backend stuff and we just focus on building APIs, microservices. And so that we teach NPM, Node.js, Express.js, which is a very popular uh, web development library. Um, and then we teach MongoDB and Mongoose. You could just as easily learn Postgres, and there's like a tool called SQLize, which is the JavaScript tool for you know working with a relational database. It's like an ORM, Object Relational mm -hmm. Mapper. So, uh, but we chose we chose MongoDB and Mongoose because you don't even need to learn SQL to be able to do that. You can write your queries in JavaScript, and it's just a little bit more forgiving and less um, takes a lot less work than writing all the migrations you need for a relational database. So, um, I think. If you're just creating a little project, Mongo is a great place to start because you just, bam, I've got my document stored database. I can just throw whatever in there and worry about it later. And you know, if you're planning to operate at huge scale, it may make sense to use uh, a traditional relational database. Or if you're doing specific types of things, like we use a relational database for our email tool, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And FreeCodeCamp, we're operating at scale with Mongo. We've got millions of users. And uh, all right, awesome. Yeah, I mean, it works, and, and we're doing it all pretty inexpensively. We actually have a, uh, a sponsor, um, MLab is a place where you can get like a hosted solution, a host cluster of MongoDB, and, and they've been very yeah. gracious and sponsored uh, FreeCodeCamp's uh, database there. So, the APIs and microservices certification, you're going to build five projects there, just like all the other certifications. Um, you're going to build a you know, timestamp microservice, um, you're going to a URL shortener exercise tracker where you can just post to the API and tr track your, your exercise. Um, and then the, the final certification we have is also back in focus and it's information security and quality assurance. And so we talk about you know using different libraries like Helmet.js uh, and Bcrypt to secure your app. And then uh, we cover some authentication, like how to, you know, uh, have a user sign into your app and, and track their session and everything. And then we have uh, quality assurance and testing, which we use Chai, which is a popular JavaScript testing library. And then uh, for the project, you're going to build a lot of things like a you know stock price checker, an anonymous message board. I don't know if anybody here has used 4chan, for example. You're basically going to build 4chan, but in API form. Uh, so yeah, uh, you'll build a lot of stuff. You'll learn a lot of uh, skills. Again, all applied. If you want to learn uh, security theory, there are so many great books that I would recommend to people uh, to get started. But it, it's just an incredibly deep and rich field. And then doing QA itself has its own. Uh, There's so many great uh, books. A lot. When I first started learning the code, I was in the Ruby uh, community. And uh, there were just so many tools for, specifically in Ruby, just writing tons of tests and um, you know being able to basically spec out your entire app using tests. So 
Uh, this again, this information security and quality assurance certification just scratches the surface of all the things you could learn. Everything in FreeCodecamp just scratches the surface. But our goal is just to get you into your first job so you can learn a whole lot. Yeah, I like working. I like it because it, it gives you what you need and it doesn't bloat it with stuff you don't need unless you if you figure out you might need it later, you can research it. Yeah, and so much of our, you know, being a developer and really being a knowledge worker in 2018 is just in time learning. So are there any other pieces of the curriculum we haven't covered or did was that the uh, the whole crash course? Yeah, that's the full curriculum. And then the, you know, we have a coding interview preparation section that has thousands of hours of additional challenges. Wow. Um, if you want to just dive in to that, uh, even for, you know, a senior developer who wants to get some additional practice, they're going to job interviews. Job interviews traditionally are kind of skewed toward recent computer science graduates. Mm -hmm. They focus a lot on data structures and algorithms that are used much more in interviews than they are in the field. But you know, you'll learn how to do like different sort, like merge sort and implement quick sort and things like that. And then uh, the data structure section covers um, you know linked lists, doubly linked lists. Uh, reversing doubly linked lists, doing binary search trees, um, a lot of stuff. Uh, matrices, breadth first search versus depth first search. And, and it's not just an explanation of what it is, you're implementing it and it's got tests. All these have lots of tests to make sure you're building it right. And then we also have, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Project Euler. And oh, yeah. after the mathematician, we, we pulled in the Project Euler, you know, the Creative Commons, we pulled in a, like a lot of their projects, their problems, and we've written our own tests to make it a little. Project Euler, the uh, interface is kind of lacking. You basically you enter, you type in a number, and it tells you whether you're right or you're wrong. Mm. That's it. We wanted to make it to where you can actually build the project and you can run tests and see how you're how you're doing along the way. So, is there any other giant takeaways that people should expect from this program? Uh, yeah, we also have study groups in uh, about 2,000 different major cities around the world. Wow. That's and that means that you can get together with people in your neighborhood and or on your university campus and, and code together. Just Google free code camp study group directory. You'll be able to find it, and it'll help you find different study groups within uh, a certain distance of you. And you can join. And some of them are more active than others. Some of them meet two or three times a week. Some of them meet um, you know, once a month. Some of them have never met yet. So they're still waiting for somebody to come along and really have like, like, hey, let's all meet here and track down a venue where they can meet and potentially, you know, get a, a food sponsor or something like that. So, um, but some of them are pretty, pretty sophisticated. So moving on uh, to, let's talk a little bit about the site and the organization. How long has Free Code Camp been around? So I created Free Code Camp in my closet on October 15, 2014, so almost four years. Wow, and how many people are using it? Uh, right now, um, millions of people a month. That's almost as many views as I'm getting, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, uh, so we've got like the, the Medium uh, publication, which is a big part of it, uh, the YouTube panel, uh, which is, is growing, and, and thanks in part to your excellent uh, teaching uh, a lot of people are discovering you and your channel through the Free Code Camp. Uh, no, I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me post some content on there. Oh, trust me, we appreciate you're helping the entire developer community because we'll, what our goal with the YouTube channel is just to basically offer it as a platform. It's growing pretty rapidly. We already we're driving a ton of people to the YouTube channel and doing everything we can to raise awareness of it so that people can find uh, new resources and new teachers and so syndicating uh, some of your some of your videos like your incredibly comprehensive database <laughs> eight, <laughs> video. Hours it's, eight hours it's long it's eight hours long uh a lot of times with, with free code camp like when we deliver this 1800 hour free open source curriculum a lot of people just are like i have to click in and find the place where where they make me pay yeah. for it right yeah oh yeah because people love to be really uh skeptical and i totally understand um but yeah that, that, i think it's kind of cool that um, cause, and if you look at the comments on the video, people are just gushing. They love it. So, um, you know, I, I think, I think we're really onto something. Uh, 
you know, people like you who are taking their programming knowledge and distilling it into these excellent videos that are really, you know, to the point and comprehensive. I think you're, you know, I mean, traditionally people would pay like Lynda.com or Pluralsight. Like you know I mean? they, they, yeah, they convince their employer to get like a big site license for them because that was the only way that they could access content that was not just topical, but actually went really deep. So when, you know, you're creating essentially a full course, like a, a proper primer on a subject, uh, you're democratizing those resources in a way that people, and, and this is the thing I have to remind people, in the United States, paying $25 a month to have access to, you know, kind of an all you can eat, like learning platform, like lynda.com or Pluralsight, doesn't seem that big of a deal. Like that's like about the price of going out and eating a reasonably nice dinner, right? Yeah. But half of the world, half of the people in the world live off two dollars a day mm -hmm. or less. So that twenty-five dollars is utterly prohibitive. There's no way they could ever afford to do something like that. Yes, they could maybe pirate it. Uh, but when you take the content and you put it on a free platform like YouTube. It's just such a profound democratization of knowledge. Yeah. And you're, you know, yes, they could probably just go to their public library and check out a book, but it's just not the same as having somebody who knows explain in front of a chalkboard. Free CoCamp itself is completely free, but I have tons of friends who have paid courses, and I think it's great. Um, I think that it's just important that they're free, like even if they're less polished versions of the knowledge out there. Yeah, like, for sure. For example, textbook companies. They make tons of money releasing new versions of and deprecating their old versions and like the student the professors like, oh, that that book shouldn't even, you know, be in this classroom because it's so out of date. But I think that, that you know, these textbook companies should probably just, you know, Open slap a Creative stuff. Commons <laughs> license on it or something. If it's if you're releasing a whole new hundred dollar version of the textbook to replace this old version, then this old version must be pretty out of date. What do you care if it's out in the public domain? Mm -hmm. So I would love for not necessarily public domain, but creative commons. But uh, I would love for more people to take that approach. But at the same time, I totally understand that creating quality content costs money. A lot of my friends, uh, like Tyler McGinnis, Wes Boss, people like that, they create content that's free as kind of a loss leader. And then they make it up because the people who do have the resources to pay for uh, you know, a premium course can do it. And so uh, by creating free, compelling, uh, good video courses, they're able to um, kind of raise awareness that they exist and that they're capable of creating such quality stuff. And then they, then they also have their premium offerings. So I think it's a great model. Yeah. And I don't have a problem with, you know, Pluralsight or Linda. I was just using them as an example. Um, I don't think that the stuff you'll find on YouTube is generally as polished mm -hmm. as something that has like a proper studio environment and you know a, a professor or somebody who has a tremendous amount of teaching experience teaching as opposed to like somebody like me who does have maybe some teaching experience but like i'm not you know i haven't worked at all the major tech companies and i don't yeah. i haven't taught at harvard or, or yale or any of these places right paid content doesn't have to be better i think with open source you can have a whole bunch because it's an entire community chipping in and gradually improving something. If you look at Wikipedia, in many ways, Wikipedia approached the factual accuracy of um, the Encyclopedia Britannica, for example, mm -hmm. just by virtue of having a whole bunch of people donating their effort. So I do think that we can have great free resources that are as good as the paid alternatives eventually in a lot of ways. Um, but I mean, in tech, I think it's kind of a fool's errand to expect the state of the art technology and the, the absolute best practices to be immediately turned into like this, you, you know, I think as a developer, if you're creating courses and stuff and you're, you know, a couple years ahead of, you know, where the free resources are, you'll, you'll always have a big market of people mm -hmm, for who, sure. who view it as an, uh, you know, as an investment in their career to, to take your paid course. Yeah. So obviously no platform or company is perfect. Where do you see free code camp lacking? What would you like to improve? Yeah, well, some things we're actively doing to improve right now is we're making it easier to contribute to it. Um, 
one of the things we're doing is we're taking, we have all these different services um, and we're trying to factor them together into a single uh, mono repo, if you will, uh, that you just run a single, you, you clone the repo and you run a single command and then boom, the entire app is running. And we can, you know, Google, for example, has 2 billion lines of code in a single repo. They had to write their own version control stuff. But for free code camp, I think our code base isn't so big that we can't do that. I mean, yeah. maybe it takes, maybe it's a few hundred megs to get like the entire version history and everything cloned. But once you have it cloned, you just run a single command and you're, you're up and you're able to meaningfully contribute. So we're just working to lower the barriers to contribution. Uh, that's definitely an area where we can improve. Uh, the second is our uh, right now a lot of people have just built applications around FreeCodeCamp by scraping FreeCodeCamp, and we're working on a, a good open API uh, so that people can access the data in FreeCodeCamp. Of course, you know we're very mindful of uh, privacy concerns and, and we're completely GDPR compliant, but we want people to be able to access like teachers who want to build their own version of like a classroom leaderboard or if they want to be able to, uh, for example, track how the individual learners are doing in their classroom and, and see if somebody's falling behind, those kinds of things. We think that we can uh, we can have a big, vibrant developer ecosystem, and I think GitHub has done a great job. Like, in a, in a time when all these people are kind of pulling back, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, all these other big APIs are limiting things further, GitHub has been doing a great job of opening things up further and, and making it easier to access their data. So we're kind of using them as, a, as a, an example. Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. For, for what we'd like to do with free cooking. What are your goals? My goals, my life is pretty simple. Basically, I'm a, I'm a dad. I've got two young children, and I'm very involved in their day-to-day -day life. I happen to be in a very fortunate position where I can work from home, and I can work whenever I want. And the rest of the time, I can be jumping uh, downstairs and, and hanging out with the kiddos. And uh, so that's a big uh, part of my life is just spending as much time with them as possible and helping my son learn to walk, helping him learn to talk, uh, helping yeah. my daughter learn to do pull-ups <laughs> and do things like that. We we do like lots of lots of time at the park doing exercise and stuff, just trying to make sure they're as healthy as possible. And then the other um, big thing in my life is free code camp and just making sure that I, you know, I have been incredibly fortunate that free code camp has taken off. I'm just some some dude. <laughs> I mean, I, I never would imagine a million years would have imagined that the open source project that I would have created would uh, become, uh, you know, a place where people spend collectively, you know millions of minutes a month. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I definitely feel uh, obligated to just focus on listening to those people and learning as much from them about what we can do to further improve it. And, you know, the open API, the better developer experience, those are two very prominent things now that we've shipped the curriculum. The curriculum itself will continue to improve incrementally. And uh, so I'm excited about just listening to feedback from the community and helping build those things out. I'm glad to see Free Code Camp be so successful. Um, you're obviously very humble and um, not cocky about it, and I think there wouldn't be anyone better to run the run the uh, organization. So I uh, applaud you for that, and I, I look up to that. So that's cool. Thank you, Caleb. That means a lot to me. Is there? Um, Anything else that we missed that you'd like to say before we uh, part ways? No, um, I just want to reiterate that um, if you're watching this and you're questioning whether you should learn to code, yes, you absolutely should learn to code. It is the new literacy. It's as important as being able to read used to be in the 1880s. It's as important as uh, being able to drive a car was in the 1930s, 1940s. It's important as knowing how to use spreadsheets and, uh, you know, slide decks and word processors in the 90s. I mean, learning to code is the next big skill that everybody has to adopt if they want to be able to work productively in the knowledge economy. And increasingly, jobs are going to require that, just like they require those other skills. So you absolutely should learn to code, and you absolutely can learn to code. It's just a matter of sitting down and spending the time 
putting the energy and using the many, many amazing resources that developers and teachers have built up over the years. So, you know, be ready, put in the time and the energy, but know that yes, you absolutely should be doing this. And regardless of what excuses may come to mind, what other people may tell you, I think you know deep inside that the direction that humanity is heading in and the increasing, increasingly important role that technology is playing in our lives, learning to code is something you should do. Totally. And I 100% agree, as you guys know. I mean, I'm all about coding. So <laughs> uh, where, how can people connect with you? Just shoot me an email like Quincy at freecocamp.org or follow me on Twitter or just, just Google me. Uh, I'm I'm on uh, Medium. I'm on on Quora to some extent, not as much lately. But but I would just say the best thing to do is just follow me on Twitter. It's twitter.com/slash ossia. Osia. It's like an alternate passage of music. Um, so if you go there, um, I tweet things that are worth your time and they can't <laughs> waste your time. Well, thank you so much, Quincy. I will leave a bunch of links and information in the description for everyone watching. So be sure to check that out. And thank you, everybody, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. Of course.